Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Amherst. I'm Reverend Michelle Buhite, and I'm the minister of this congregation. We are so glad that you have chosen to spend part of your Sunday morning with us. Please see our website, uuamherst.org, or our weekly update for opportunities to connect and grow your soul. Today's opening reading is from Joseph B. Worthlin. Those who stand at the threshold of life, always waiting for the right time to change, are like the person who stands at the bank of a river, waiting for the water to pass by so they can cross on dry land. The flaming chalice is the symbol of Unitarian Universalism, the light of truth, the warmth of community, and the fire of our commitment to bring more justice and compassion to a hurting world. We light this chalice for Unitarian Universalism. This is the church of the open mind, the loving heart, and the helping hands where we can come and be friends together. It's been said that Unitarian Universalism is the religion that puts its faith in you trusting each individual to engage in the spiritual journey and to reach our own conclusions about spiritual matters. We do that in beloved community as we support one another in faith and friendship. In that spirit, this congregation has created a covenant, a sacred promise of how we will strive to be with one another. Please join me in speaking our covenant. Together we promise to gather in compassionate community, to celebrate diversity of thought and unity of spirit, and to seek wholeness for ourselves, our children, and our world. So normally we start with watch where I go get the story in case you want to make it part of your work later. But obviously I can't do that today. like this. Now I think we're ready to go. begin. So this tree represents Unitarian Universalism. This is the tree of our religion. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have seven branches. That reminds me of our seven promises. The promises we make to each other to help us live in community. And so these branches have seeds and leaves on them and those seeds and leaves are our promises. So our first promise is red. We promise to respect all people. And to help us remember this red promise, we like to think of everyone as a gift. So all people are a gift. We don't really know what's inside of them, but they're precious and special. And so we try to think of the red promise as a gift. So our next promise is orange. We promise to offer fair and kind treatment to all. Because if all people are a gift, then we want to treat them fair and kind. And this orange heart helps us remember to be kind. So red, orange, and yellow. Our next promise is yellow. We promise to yearn to accept and learn about ourselves, others, and the mystery. Now yearn is meaning to sort of wish or hope. And so we're hoping to learn and accept about ourselves in the mystery. And this flame helps us remember that sort of fire, that yearning. So red, orange, yellow, green. Green is our next promise. We promise to grow by exploring what is true and right in life. And so sometimes 
exploring what is true in life and growing is hard, but we ask questions and we learn and we grow. And so we remember this green flower to help us remember growing. So next is blue. We promise to believe in our ideas and act on them. So in order to believe in our ideas and act on them, we have to listen to the little voice inside. And this bell helps us remember that. We also want to listen to other people's voices and what they tell us. And that's another part of the blue promise. So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo. Now indigo is a special dark blue. And our indigo promise is insist on a peaceful, fair, and free world for all. There's a lot to that one. It means we try to do what is right. We want freedom and justice for everyone. And justice means to be fair to everyone. And peace means to live in harmony. And the symbol for peace is often a dove, which is a bird. And so our symbol to remind our indigo promise is this dark blue bird. And so our seventh principle is violet, which is sort of a light purple. And that promise is value our home earth that we share with all living creatures. So just as we respect all people, we want to respect all the creatures on earth. And to remember that, we have this violet globe or world. So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet are seven promises that we make to each other to live in the community of Unitarian Universalism. But our promises have grown because they have the roots feeding us and down there are our roots. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six. We have six roots feeding us. And our roots are our sources. Now our first source is wonder and awe. And the symbol for that is the star with a spiral in it. I think it goes that way. So I'm gonna put that down there. Our beliefs come from our sense of wonder. We learn by asking why. Our next source is people's story, and our symbol is this person with a little heart. Our beliefs come from the people of long ago and today whose lives remind us to be, fine, remind us to be kind and fair. Oh look, it's our kind heart. We learn by hearing their stories. So now our third is world religions. So we have lots of symbols for world religions. Maybe later you can look at this closely. These are symbols of various religions around the world. And our beliefs on how to live together come from all the world's religions. We learn from many cultures. So our next source has a Jewish star and a Christian cart, a Christian cross in a heart. Because Unitarian Universalism came originally from Christianity, which came from Judaism. And our beliefs come from the Jewish and Christian teachings that tell us to love all others as we love ourselves. We learn from our past history, and so that's why we have a heart on this one. One, two, three, four, five. So our fifth is reason and science. And our symbol for that, I think this is an atom, it comes from science. Our beliefs come from the use of reason and the discoveries of science. We learn by using our minds. And our last source is nature and the cycles of life. And the symbol for that is this plant with some grass. Our beliefs come from the harmony of nature and the sacred circle of life. We learn by knowing we are part of nature and the cycles of life. So there's our six sources and our seven promises. Our promises come from our sources and what we learn from their stories, but it also comes from something else. In spirit play, that 
something else is the spirit of love and mystery that some people call God. And in spirit play, we represent that with a circle of sparkly or shiny gold. So our sources come from the spirit of love and mystery that some people call God. I'm going to put that down there. So all of our sources, our roots of our tree of Unitarian Universalism, feed our branches. I wonder, I wonder if you have ever heard any of this before. I wonder which of these you like best. I wonder if any of the promises are more important than the others. I wonder if any of the sources are more important than the others. So watch how I put the story away. In case you make it part of your work, you'll know how to prepare it for someone else. So first I'm going to start with my sources. I'm going to put together, put away with nature and science and reason, and Judeo-Christian and world religions, people's stories, and wonder and awe. I'm going to also put away the sparkly circle that represents the spirit of love and mystery that some people call God. Next, I'm going to put away our promises. I think I'm going to go in order. So I'm going to put away red we promise to respect all people. And orange, offer fair and kind treatment to all. And yellow, we promise to yearn and accept and learn about ourselves, others, and the mystery. Green, we promise to grow by exploring what is true and right in life. Blue, we promise to believe in our ideas and act on them. Indigo, we insist on a peaceful, fair, and free world for all. And violet, we value our home, earth, that we share. And we put away our symbol of Unitarian Universalism, our flaming chalice. Then I'm going to fold up our tree very carefully. Tucking all the roots. Hard to fold that, isn't it? Alright, unless it's right in here. And then I'm going to fold up our underlay. And I'll go put it on the story so you know where to find it. to a space of meditation and inner focus. 
Begin by taking a moment to get comfortable in your space. Ground yourself with a pose that is restful, yet focused. If some part of your body can touch the floor, that may help you to feel secure and relaxed. Now find a way for your shoulders, head, and face to relax as well. Maybe you'd like to close your eyes. Or maybe you want to find a soft gaze that feels comfortable for your eye sockets. And now begin to breathe more deeply and more slowly, taking in an ample amount of air and then breathing it out slowly and smoothly. Breathing in, breathing out. And now continue to smooth and even out that breath, taking in oxygen slowly and deeply, and then slowly and calmly exhaling carbon dioxide. And notice, as you do this, that there is no threshold between breathing in and breathing out. Only a little pause, like a ball thrown up in an arc, pauses just a little at the top of its path through the air, and then begins to return to the earth. Your body knows exactly when to flow into the next part of the cycle of breaths. Although a threshold appears to us as a stark boundary between one thing and another, the way we travel through it is actually with a series of infinitely tiny motions. So there's really not a line between here and there. There is only the action of flowing from one state to another. It's up to you now. You can keep on breathing and simply focus on that place where an in-breath turns into an out-breath. And where an out-breath turns back into an in-breath. Enjoying your feeling of being alive, of infinite giving to and receiving from the universe. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. The gateway is the frontier between heaven and the mundane. Arriving here is a recognition of your readiness to contact the numinous, the divine to illuminate your experience so that its meaning shines through its form. The gateway is not to be approached and passed through without contemplation. Here you are being confronted with the true reflection of what is hidden in yourself, what must be exposed and examined before successful action can be undertaken. Visualize yourself standing before a gateway on a, on a hilltop. Your entire life lies out behind you and below. Before you step through, pause and review the past, the learning and the joys, the victories and the sorrows, everything it took for you to get you here. Observe it all, bless it all, and release it all. For in letting go of the past, you reclaim your power.
from the Book of Runes by Ralph Blum. I have journeyed with the runes as a spiritual practice for over 30 years. Ralph Blum's interpretations and my own intuitive readings continue to inspire and teach me to listen to that inner voice and pay attention to my life. When I read the interpretation for Thuris as the gateway or threshold rune, I always think of the phrase, don't just do something, sit there. You see, I am a doer. I am much more comfortable coming up with long lists of solutions than I am in sitting in the ambiguity of the moment. I can't tell you how many metaphorical gateways I have crashed through like a character in a movie car chase. Wham! It has taken me decades to begin to feel comfortable with the liminal space that the threshold or gateway offers. A place to pause, to reflect, bless, and release. Whether pausing and reflecting on the victories and sorrows, the learnings and joys is an easy and well-established practice for you, or something you dread and avoid, it is an important part of the spiritual journey. We all need a little breather, opportunities to reflect and reset the trajectory of our lives. Don't just do something, sit there. If we were gathered in our beloved chapel, this would be the moment when the ushers would come forward and pass the offering baskets around. And we can do that virtually. Simply go to our website, uuamherst.org, and click on the giving link. And now listen and watch this music video by the choir of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Kent, Ohio, led by my friend Hal Walker. We drink water from wells we did not dig. This is as it should be, so long as we dig and plant for those who will come after us. Those who stand at the threshold of life, always waiting for the right time to change, are like the person who stands at the bank of a river, waiting for the water to pass so they can cross on dry land. Good morning, friends. Throughout this period of pause, 
all of us have experienced so many changes, so many emotions, so much disruption to our daily habits and rituals. We have had to create new ways of doing and being for ourselves, our families, and for this church. This week, we received guidance from the Unitarian Universalist Association about this coming year's planning, and it confirms what some of us have suspected, that we need to remain vigilant in keeping our community members safe by doing as much as possible remotely and avoiding large gatherings through May of 2021. I believe that church communities are essential to people's health and well being. There is no question. I've had a church community surrounding me most of my life and see a great emptiness in our society when membership in churches and in civic organizations diminishes. I also believe that if we are capable of adapting to a new normal in order to carry on in our work, avoiding endangering our beloved community members, we should do so. We can adapt to any situation if the will to carry on within our mission to foster justice and compassion is strong enough. And I believe it is. How have we been doing this within the framework of change that really has been caused by the mind of a virus and the responses of our governmental and scientific leadership? Most immediately, Reverend Michelle, along with a willing staff and the help of a generous ad hoc team of techies, moved our services online. These iterations have evolved over this relatively short time and will continue to evolve. They have moved from live from church to live from our homes to recorded outside at, at the church or inside the church and at our homes they have included readings from beloved community members and frank and honest conversations about who we are and what we bring to this table. Look at it all. Look at how beautiful we are. There is a great little pocket guide for young adult programs called Becoming. And some of the readings from that have made their way into some of our Zoom meetings that I've participated in and led over these past couple months. This one is called Lucky Streak by Angela Herrera. Who can cast a spell over my world? Who opened the doors, stirred the crowd of possibilities, put gold dust in my dreams, causing my life to turn? Oh fate, oh love, oh spirit, oh God, is it true that all good things must end? Or, have you set me on a path of meaning, not luck, of clarity, not magic? And this grace that brought me to the mountaintop is also a sign to carry me through the dark forests of loss, the ones that await us all, that disturb our peaceful sleep. The same grace that guides the seasons, cracking the ice, pushing up saplings, scattering the earth with their first dramatic leaves. As we gather together at this threshold of uncertainty, we are in a doorway we have never been in. How are we harnessing the grace of love, faith, spirit, God? How will we muster up the will to continue searching for meaning and for clarity when it feels like we may never emerge from the goo? Our beautiful minds and hearts have come together to explore how we can continue to connect with UU Amherst folks we already know and with those we have never met. Our village project is underway and I am so ecstatic to report that our two leader meetings, one this week and one two weeks prior, have had perfect attendance. This is absolutely astounding. You are all so very blessed to have these beautiful people in your midst. Think of it, 15 people from this beloved community on task with holding all of us together. 
with creating new possibilities for connection when we will continue to gather virtually for some time. Coming together thoughtfully and with a sense of commitment. Mindfully creating a covenant within our smaller group to practice the wholeness we share in our church-wide covenant each week. Yet there still has been anxiety among these leaders. We will continually acknowledge this and encourage one another to keep going, to keep inviting, to celebrate when it's time to celebrate, and to hold each other in sadness when there are reasons to. There has been anxiety expressed about being involved, around opening up to unfamiliar faces, and perhaps going deeper with people we already know. This is okay. We can be broken and whole at the same time. In fact, our faith calls us to recognize this over and over. Speaking of celebrating, as we give thanks to our village coordinators and to those who have agreed and participated in these connection efforts so far, let us also acknowledge the faith development team where this was born almost a year ago. Let us celebrate one of our dearest team members and longtime chair, Janine Moyer, who will be moving from this role and into a term on the Board of Trustees. Thank you for your wholehearted service and faith development. I know you will bring so much generosity and ability to the board table. I am truly grateful for your continued service to this beloved community. Our innovation and progress moving to this threshold of a new normal, adding a level of patience and support that we may have never needed before in our lives is truly remarkable. In reporting good news from Reverend Michelle, there are multiple congregations of other faiths who are noticing and curious about what we are doing. We should be proud. We should be humble that our loving one another is truly noticeable. Threshold by Maggie Smith. You want a door, you can be on both sides at once. You want it to be on both sides of here and there, now and then, together and what did we call the life we would wish back? The old life, the before, alone. But any open space may be a threshold, an arch of entering and leaving crossing a field, wading through nothing but Timothy grass, imagine yourself passing from and into, passing through doorway after doorway after doorway. A door where we can be on both sides at once, inside, and outside simultaneously. This is not some kind of hocus pocus. In fact, there is a famous thought experiment that captures this both and paradox quite well. Perhaps you've heard of Schrodinger's cat. In this thought experiment from 1935, Edwin Schrodinger posited that a hypothetical cat in a box under certain circumstances is simultaneously alive and dead. Both are possible in the ambiguity. Until the box is opened, of course. But in the not knowing, the cat is both alive and dead. Now Schrodinger was not obsessed with cats. He was posing the question of when does a quantum system stop existing as a superposition of states and become one or the other. Now what on earth does that have to do with us? I believe that we are living in a variation of this question that I will call Schrodinger's Church. We are simultaneously open and closed. We are gathered and we are separated. 
we are both here and not here. In Schrodinger's church, we are living in the ambiguity, in the pause, the threshold between then, in the past tense, and then, in the future tense. And like the paradox of the cat, our continued existence is dependent upon certain conditions coming into play. As Angela mentioned, our denominational association has released guidelines that, barring a miraculous convergence of events, our churches should remain closed to large gatherings for a year. A year. In Schrodinger's church, the time of ambiguity just increased to a point that stretches our capacity to comprehend it. How long can that cat remain in the box, both living and not living? How long can we continue to be the church when we are unable to gather in the church? You've heard and probably even said with some conviction, we are the church. The building is just the building. And it's true. We are the church. But what does that look like when the long view is one of separation and isolation? We are at a threshold, a place of uncertainty, of neither and both, of gathering and separation. So perhaps you've been riding out the past two months with gritted teeth toughing it out with the idea that we'd all be back together by summer or at the very latest in the fall. You've resisted connecting through Zoom, unsure about this technology, and what you might be inviting into your computer by downloading the app. Maybe you rolled your eyes a little bit about the notion of connecting in virtual villages, figuring you would just wait it out for a few more weeks. Well, friends, here we are, together, but not gathered. Our new reality, the new normal for the foreseeable future, is to be separated from one another physically. So we must find other ways to be the beloved community. I urge you to connect with your church friends. We have several weekly gatherings already happening, with more being planned. There is a bountiful feast prepared for you. Please come to the table and partake. Invite others to join you. There will never be an easier time to invite family and friends to check out your church. Remember that there are others who depend upon you, who look forward to seeing you, even if it is just a small square in a Zoom meeting. The church is here for you, and we need you to be present for others. I am asking you to stretch way beyond your comfort zone. Call and check on your friends. Make the first move, even if it seems like you always have to make the first move. Our relationships are even more precious in these weeks and months of separation and isolation. We are at a threshold, at the brink of something new, something that is waiting to be born in us, even as old ways fall away and die. We cannot revive or relive that which has been. We can only open ourselves to usher in the new, that which is awaiting our attention and energy. We must not stand at the bank of the river waiting for the water to pass by so we can walk across on dry ground, safe from the unfamiliar and untested. That's not how rivers work. And it's not how our lives unfold. Let me close with this prophecy that was shared by the elders of the Hopi Nation in June of 2000. It's the reading with which I close each Saturday morning shared caring circle. 
to my fellow swimmers. Here is a river flowing now very fast. It is so great and swift that there are those who will be afraid, who will try to hold on to the shore. They are being torn apart and will suffer greatly. Know that the river has its destination. The elders say that we must let go of the shore, push off into the middle of the river and keep our heads above water. And I say, see who is there with you and celebrate. At this time in history, we are to take nothing personally, least of all ourselves. For the moment we do, our spiritual growth and journey come to a halt. The time of the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves. Banish the word struggle from your attitude and your vocabulary. All that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration. For we are the ones we've been waiting for. Each week we affirm the light of truth the warmth of community, and the fire of commitment. Those are three concentric circles, with the light of truth being the closest as an individual endeavor. The warmth of community is the circle that includes others in our immediate circle. And the fire of commitment reaches out into the larger world. At this time, we consider those in our more immediate circle. We hold one another in care and trust that we too are held. Cherishing that warmth, please join your hearts with mine in the spirit of prayer. Spirit of community, in which we share and find strength and common purpose. We turn our minds and hearts toward one another, seeking to bring into our circle of concern all who need our love and support those who are ill, those who are in pain, either in body or in spirit, those who are lonely, those who have been wronged. We are part of a web of life that makes us one with all the universe. We are grateful for the miracle of consciousness that we share, the consciousness that gives us the power to remember, to love, to care. Amen, Ashe, blessed be. Though I still and small, deep inside all, I hear you call singing in dark and rain. Sorrow and pain, still you remain singing, calming my fears, quenching my tears through all the years singing. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Travel light and travel easy Till I see you once again Travel light and travel easy and remember I'm your friend. Our benediction today is a poem by Anne Hillman entitled, We Look With Uncertainty. We look with uncertainty beyond the old choices for clear-cut answers to a softer, more permeable aliveness, which is every moment at the brink of death, for something new is being born in us if we but let it. We stand at a new doorway, awaiting that which comes, 
daring to be human creatures, vulnerable to the beauty of existence, learning to love. Thank you for joining us in worship today. Do see our website, uumhurst.org, or our weekly email updates to find out ways how you can get connected. We look forward to seeing you again. Be well.